Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Munro, and um, I work for EDP. And I'm gonna be talking about queues and Postgres. This is a little bit different than um, all of the talks, in th at least in this room today, because it's application track. It's about using Postgres. It's not about um, internal details of Postgres and Postgres development. <coughs> so um, just a quick note about myself. I've been working for Enterprise DB, Enterprise DB for about a year, um, where I work on EDB Postgres Advanced Server and also Postgres. Um, I've made a couple of minor contributions to Postgres so far. Um, the one in bold there is skip locked, which is gonna be mentioned in this talk, which is why I mentioned that, and a couple of other things. Okay, so this is the structure of the talk. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about what a queue is. Um, so first of all, just a dictionary definition. Outside North America, queue is kind of the normal word for a line of people or cars or something, right? Um, I, I heard that the term is catching on in North America as well, thanks to Netflix, which you, they, they have a queue feature for queuing up films, right? So I'm kind of entering common parlance um, over here as well. Um, so that definition of the word is essentially the same as the computing definition, um, which is a list of data, this is the Oxford Dictionary de definition, a list of data items, commands, etc., stored in a way that allows them to, to be retrieved in a definite order. And it's usually the order of insertion. And I've put definite order in bold there, so we can talk about what that actually means. Um, I've just got my own informal taxonomy of, of queue-like things here. First of all, there are queues, proper queues, um, first in, first out queues, um, and priority queues, and we'll look at those in a moment. And then we have queues, with air quotes, which are things commonly called queues, which might not strictly uh, fit the computer science definition of queues. For example, the I.O. queues of operating systems, um, which reorder things and merge things and completely unordered queues, which are obviously not technically queues at all if they don't have an order, because that's kind of part of the definition. So, um, <coughs> firstly, mostly when you hear the word queue, people are usually thinking of FIFO queues, first in, first out. Um, and they're often used in low-level systems because they have simple implementations where the, the ordering is linked to the physical representation or physical layout and memory, and there's, you know, circular buffers and linked lists and so on, uh, simple ways to implement those things. But more, slightly more generally, um, priority queues are the same sort of thing, except where there's some explicit logical ordering, where you perhaps put a number on things, or you know something which is part of the, the, the message controls the order that things go in. And the implementation techniques for priority queues usually look a little bit like sorting systems. They involve trees and the sort of things that you see in sorting algorithms. Um, then we have specialized queues, and these are queues with air quotes. Um, a good example is a, an elevator or lift um, or an operating system I.O. scheduler. Allegedly, they behave with better efficiency because, by merging together um, requests for, for example, blocks that are adjacent to each other on disk or something like that. But it sort of looks like a queue if you squint and tilt your head slightly because you put things in and things come out and um, in some order, which is perhaps complicated to describe and might even depend on the system clock or other kinds of external factors like where the disk head is or something like that. Um, and finally, you might have completely unordered or approximately ordered queues. Um, now, often we don't really care about the order that things come out of a queue that we put things into. For example, if you have a queue for emails that are going to be blasted out to the world, you might not really care if they get sent out in the right order. But probably you at least care that they come out vaguely in a fair order approximately because you don't want it to be possible for a single thing in the queue to get stuck forever. Like imagine a, you throw a basketball off the Niagara Falls or something and it gets stuck at the bottom and doesn't manage to escape even though the water mostly is flowing through. We don't want that to happen. So to exclude that kind of thing, an approximate ordering can be a very useful thing to have. So um, why would you put a queue into a relational database? Um, uh, Whenever I talk about this subject um, to some people, they immediately start saying, well, you should be using Redis, or you should be using this, that, or the other. And there's a whole universe of different technologies that do something related to queuing or messaging. And those things have all different properties, and, and, you know, and, and sometimes some of those specialized technologies are the thing you should be using. And I'm certainly not claiming that you should always try and use your relational database to do queuing. But sometimes it can be the right tool for the job. Um, so some of the characteristics that I think make it worth considering using your existing relational database for, for queuing things. Um, uh, the key one is this top item here, 
that you want to do some kind of reliable persistent message processing which is atomic with respect to other database work that you're doing. Um, now you can achieve um, <coughs> transactional semantics with external messaging systems as well, but then you have to bring um, you know, XA systems or two-phase commit and other complications into your life. But for many simple tasks, it's reasonable to put things into, a, uh, into existing transactions in your existing uh, relational database. Um, so some other advantages to doing that are that you you know, you probably already have a system of backups and failover and, and you know, you, you, you've got a whole bunch of infrastructure in place and you don't really want to add any more moving parts. But obviously this is only going, to be, only going to make sense if your rates of messages and numbers of consumers are sort of in the range that your database can reasonably handle. That kind of goes without saying. But that's kind of, if you look at the first point and the third point there, if, if you're trying to do something which is transactional with respect to existing work in your database, then you kind of already need your database to be able to keep up with the work that you're doing. So combining those things in, 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 in an existing database that you already have can often make a lot of sense. And the fourth point there, obviously, if you really like Postgres and you're good at using it and you, you're, you, know, you, have, and you, you, you like it so much that you even come to conferences about it, then it, you know, that, that's going to be a, a point in, in favor of, of considering that. Um, so let's look at some example use cases. Um, if you're mixing... Uh, database transactions with some kind of external effects, then you might want to use um, a, a, something that looks a bit like a message queue to separate those things. Um, so this, in this example, we want to book a seat on a plane, and we're doing a, a booking management system of some kind. And we also want to send SMS messages, you know, like on a phone, um, to confirm bookings and seat numbers, right? So these two operations, um, updating something in the database to say that, you know, this customer has bought a seat on the plane or whatever, as a database transaction, and also we've got this external system which can send SMSs to people. Now, this is, obvi this is obviously a ridiculous way to do it because it's it can go horribly wrong. You begin a transaction, insert something into a database to say, this customer has bought a seat on the plane. You then send an SMS to the, to the customer and then try and commit. But right at that moment, um, something goes horribly wrong. You know, you, 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 it, more likely, it's probably not going to be an asteroid hitting the server, literally, but it could be a temporary loss of network connectivity or something like that, um, and so we don't commit. So now we've, you know, we've sent this SMS out uh, to tell someone that they have a seat on a plane, and they don't have it because we've forgotten all about it. We didn't commit that transaction. Obviously, that's not the right way to do it. So if that's take one, if we try take two, begin the database transaction, do all the stuff you need to do to book a seat on a plane, and commit that, and next we're going to send the SMS message. But at that time, suddenly there's a flood or you lose network connectivity or something less dramatic happens. Um, and now we haven't sent any SMS and we haven't got any persistent record of the fact that we intended to do that. Um, we haven't really succeeded in doing our two jobs. It's a better failure mode than the previous one when, when we told the customer that they had a seat on the plane when in fact they don't, but it's still not ideal. Um, take three is we separate these two things into two different transactions. Firstly, we begin our transaction, book a seat on a plane, in queue something in that transaction, we say we, we're essentially uh, logging our intention to inform the customer. And then we commit, and then a separate piece of machinery says, ah, there's a, there's a, there's a job for me to process in that queue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and dequeue that and send the SMS. Now, if, and, and then commit if that succeeds. And you can imagine that there are various failure, failure points in that second step there. But so long as, um, so long as, sending SMSs is an idempotent, or idempotent, depending on how you prefer to say that, um, operation. If you do it twice, then it doesn't matter. And then if you don't have such a setup, then it's possible you might send, send the SMS to the person twice. But if you don't consider that to be a disaster, or preferably if um, such operation, operations are prevented, then that can't go wrong. Then you have a much better system. Um, Obviously, you have to consider the possibility that sending an SMS fails, but because you have this um, queue in place, you have the possibility to retry that later. Um, okay, so some other things you might like to do with a, with, with a, with a database queue um, are farming work out to some large pool of worker servers or any kind of aggregation or something like that that you want to do that doesn't have to be done in transaction because you've got some interactive um, transaction happening, you want to do it as fast as possible, but you want to make sure that you go and update some other numbers eventually. That's another good reason to use such a, uh, such a design. Okay, so let's talk about how you might implement something like that in Postgres. 
<coughs> so the basic ingredients we're going to use here are, unsurprisingly, a table, which is going to have rows representing messages. And for controlling the priority, we're just going to be using um, normal SQL um, order by. For signaling between different um, clients that are connected to this database, we're going to be using notify and listen. Um, how many people are familiar with notify and listen? Everyone, pretty much. Yeah, that's good. Um, and to deal with concurrency, well, there's a few different options, and we'll look at those in a moment. Um, now, one thing to note is that the relational mo model and, and SQL databases generally um, don't expose details of the physical ordering. Um, so if you want a FIFO queue, there's no way to, to get that without really doing it explicitly as some kind of ordering. So really, we just have priority queues in, 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 in our database. Um, OK. So the basic protocol is going to be something like insert some message into a table, which should be very unsurprising, um, and then notify somebody using the, the notify facility, the facility. And of course, notify actually defers notifications until after commit succeeds. So it's kind of a post-commit activity. So um, if it fails after notify returns, but before you commit, then no notification takes place, which is good. Uh, one thing to note about in queuing things is that um, if you if you are very sensitive to time ordering, and you've got um, sessions inserting concurrently, it is actually quite difficult to generate a key that increases monotonically, uh, monotonically with respect to the order of visibility of transactions, because commit order is not necessarily the same as the order that you generate keys in. Um, I, I believe there are some other databases that have ways of doing that. Um, I think Oracle has a way to uh, record, the com uh, record a commit sequence number and things. We don't have anything like that in Postgres, and that's actually quite a difficult problem. We do? Say. OK. So that's something that's part of the, that's, that's. An advisory lack of release and commit also be. Right. So um, you have to think quite difficult, you have to think about that quite hard, I think, if you, and, and, and to, to get that to work if you've got con um, concurrent insertions. But certainly doing it naively by just using a sequence or something, it's, it's not guaranteed to work. So that's just a small note. Um, the, now the, yes. Yes, you could, but, but let's say two different, uh, forgetting the possibility that two people might, might see the same time exactly, um, e even if you forget that problem, it's still possible that session A sees a time that's earlier than session B, but then session B commits before session A. So I'm talking specifically about the, what, about the correlation between the order that, things, that these transactions become visible to someone else. And the, the time, and it, you know, it's 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 difficult. And the reason that Oracle uses a, provides a way to do a, a commit sequence number is specifically because they wanted. I, this is my speculation, but I believe they needed that to do um, replication, and that's specifically the certain thing that um, I think Andrew is referring to. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, Peter. If it's important, it would be important if you were doing some kinds of replication type things. And that's probably what Andres is referring to, I think, when he talks about it. Yeah. Um, but most people don't care about that. It depends whether there is actually a strict uh, dependency between the messages in your queue or not. And if you're just using a, a, a queue to, to queue up emails that need to go out or something like that, then you probably don't care. There isn't really a strict, strict problem. Uh, I'll come back to that point, though. So um, as for dequeuing protocols, um, here's take one, very naive. Just go and select one row in the correct order. Um, this will work as long as you don't have, uh, you know, um, concurrent sessions doing it, and that's obviously not going to be good enough for, for, for many use cases. But it could be. Um, this is just a starting point, um, naively selecting single rows. Um, <coughs> doing something and then deleting the row. It's a very simple approach. Um, so. If your isolation level is anything below serializable and you try and do this with concurrent sessions, then it, you're going to get into trouble pretty soon. And if you try and do it with serializable level, then at, mo at most one overlapping succession is going to be able to succeed with these transactions. Um, so this is a kind of work case wor uh, worst case workload for serializable isolation. Um, so um, we can only really get one session doing this at a time uh, and have it work. Um, on These are just some numbers from my laptop. I managed to um, pull out somewhere a bit under 3,000 um, messages per second. And that's actually just the, the, tr the transaction rate that I can commit simple small transactions on this particular computer. 
um, and th those numbers could be completely different on different types of uh, disk subsystems. Um, so presumably, um, pulling things out one at a time is, is not going to be enough for, for many use cases. So um, a typical approach is to use um, explicit row locking. So exactly the same as before, we're selecting rows in order, limiting it to one, but using for update to get a uh, row lock on a single, single row. So if we try and do that with um, loads of clients, um, here I went up to eight, um, the total throughput across all clients um, goes up when you get to two clients, but then starts going down. And that shouldn't be surprising because these, um, these clients are all going to be competing for locks on the same row, whichever row is the head of the queue, basically the next. They're all trying to select the same one. So only one of the clients succeeds. And the reason why we got some additional performance when we went to two clients is to do with pipelining and the other work that's going on and the chatter between the client and the server and so on. But that doesn't, doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't get you much, it doesn't get you much extra performance and then when you get to three it starts going down. Um, so the next step um, is to add skip locked um, or if you're using Post Postgres versions before 9.5 you could use advisory locks um, with a little bit of extra work. Um, and that says, um, basically, d instead of queuing up to, to wait for the same row, they're going to step over the, the locked rows and, um, and enable you to get some more concurrency. And here you can see that it goes up um, fairly nicely until it gets to about the number of CPU, co CPU cores I happen to have. And then it goes just up just a little bit more. And then you can see it's starting to plateau. Presumably, if I tried with loads more clients, it would be uh, plateauing or maybe going down slightly or something like that. Um, so what's going on here is that the first uh, client comes along and manages to lock the first row. The second client comes in and you see it tries to lock the first row, can't get, can't get the lock, so it just moves to the next one and so on. So you get this nice um, spreading out of work which enables it to scale. So coming back to the point we made earlier, um, the order by clause is, still con is controlling the time that we start processing each item, but it doesn't control the order that we commit. Um, those things are probably highly correlated, but they're not strictly correlated. Um, so, um, also, anything that uh, anything that anything that dequeues and then rolls back will cause further perturbation of the processing order. Um, so, this slightly looser ordering is is really good for concurrency, while still being approximately fair to all messages. Um, and that's important to prevent the scenario I described before as a basketball going over the Niagara Falls and getting trapped at the bottom in the churn and never coming out. And that could, you know, what, what that really means is that, well, that's an extreme example, but you, if, if you want, if you've got an email queue and you've, the messages and the, the, the rows in this table represent emails that need to be sent out, what you don't want is for some emails to be sent um, with a very high latency and some with a very low latency because of the randomness of the churn of these, you know, the, the um, ordering. So you still want some kind of loose order, typically. Okay, so what kind of problems do we face when we, when we um, try to implement these things? Um, <coughs> so that, that very simple protocol I described um, had messages which are locked, um, worked on by some kind of worker process while, while they're locked, and then deleted in the same, tra same transaction, which is very simple. But it doesn't really let us deal with failure modes very well. For example, um, what if you can't send an SMS, if that's what the worker's trying to do? And, um, you probably want to give it, you probably want to retry. So one approach is to have a retry counter on messages, um, leave them in the queue, um, and then give up after some maximum number of retries. Um, but you probably don't want to retry at full speed because if the SMS service is not working right now, the chances that it's not working again immediately may, not, may or may not be high. Maybe you want to try again once quickly, and then maybe you want to, wait a minute or something like that because the service might, might, might return later. So then you might want to have a delay time which you put into the messaging queue. Or you might want to manage that with some other approach. Um, and another kind of resilience which may or may not be useful depending on what sort of problem you're working on. If it's possible that backends might crash or hang or get stuck, um, but you still want work to, to, to go on, then it is possible to des design slightly more complex systems where messages can be stolen from an existing worker, and then you sort of do that with a, uh, with a protocol involving, uh, double, uh, involving two transactions, um, which I, I'm not going to go into in detail. But. Okay, some other considerations when doing these kinds of things are um, I've seen people use integers as, as a primary key, um, and you know, they pretty quickly run out and get into trouble. Um, 
then there's the question of the uh, of sequences um, being inappropriate for generating a strict order if concurrency is involved. Um, another problem that um, you can run into is if you're using B trees and you're you've got ordering which is not correlated to the insert order, you can get into a, a problem of generating a lot of bloat. And and the next problem which I mentioned here is um something which I haven't actually ever seen on Postgres, but I have seen on DB2. I think it should, in theory, apply to Postgres, although I haven't come across it myself, um, which is that if you've got a table that sometimes has no rows in it and sometimes has billions of rows in it and um, Analyze runs at kind of pretty arbitrary times, you can finish up with some really bad statistics one day kind of at random. Um, so DB2 actually has a feature to deal with that, and I've kind of wondered before whether Postgres ought to have that. It's a th you can basically say this, um, this table is volatile, and it causes the um, statistics to be tweaked in a certain way that make it less susceptible to going crazy just because it happened to run analyze at a moment when it was empty. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Andres. If the, case, if the analyze time could table be empty, you'd expect to see the next person to <laughs> So yes, the problem is fixed. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so maybe that's a feature that could be looked into for Postgres. Um, um, right, so if there's no ordering requirement at all, in theory, you don't actually need to have any indexes on a queue table if, you, if you're prepared to just use the um, CTID to refer to indiv individual rows that you select and lock. Um, although that might, um, some people might not, be, might not be very comfortable with um, having a table with no primary key or, or unique identifier or whatever for aesthetic reasons or others. Um, so, um, and then the last point is actually something I'm going to talk about in more detail. Um, so, default vacuum settings could easily be completely insufficient for this kind of workload if you're doing you know, high numbers of, of, um, of message throughput. And that's not really specific to, to Q-type workloads at all, really. That's just any kind of um, busy workload that's doing a lot of writes and, and a high transaction rate. Um, vacuum can easily become a problem. Um, so here I've um, plotted some, some graphs that show um, in green the number of dead rows in a dead tuples in a um, Q-like table. And in, what do you call that color, magenta, there's, um, it's showing the number of messages it's dequeuing per second um, using, I think, a couple of, a couple of clients connected uh, concurrently. Uh, you can see that it's sort of humming along there, just slightly below 4,000 uh, messages per second coming out of this queue. And you can see that the number of, um, in the top left-hand uh, graph here, and you can see that the number of dead rows goes up, 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 up. And then every minute, that's seconds along the bottom there. So every minute you see that um, sawtooth shape as vacuum comes along and vacuums up all of those dead um, tubules. And that's actually looking not too bad, I think. And it's because it's not, I'm not really making it do too much work. And, and that's actually using default settings straight out of the box, Postgres built, installed, and, and uh, it's kind of doing OK. But if you move over to the next one in the top right-hand corner, you can see that the, the rate at which it dequeues messages starts to go crazy. And, the, and this is because in, in this case, I've actually pumped tons and tons of messages, which are rows into a table, and produced this completely bizarre, unstable performance. Um, uh, what's the parameter? That's a problem. This um, video is uh, lower resolution than I was. Uh, so the cyan one uh, shows you the number of dead tuples in a table. So that's, sorry, uh, the Oh, the si right. The sign one at the bottom is the number of live rows in the table, which at the bottom is just, in the top left one is just uh, going along the bottom. Uh, in the second one, it's backing up. And, and the reason for that is that I started inserting tons more into it to see if I could kind of overload it. What I was trying to do is get it to, was to kind of overload the um, whole vacuum setup and make it misbehave to sort of see a disaster scenario. And, you know, presumably if this happened to you, you'd be unhappy because you probably don't want your message throughput um, to... Um, become really unstable like that. So what happens halfway through that, that cost of dequeuing to suddenly start performing better and the vacuum is doing what you're saying? Yeah, so at about... At this point here, I stopped inserting new, new rows. Um, so you can see that in the top right-hand chart there, you can see that um, somewhere around 4,000, there's a line that it wants to be at, but it keeps falling down from there. Um, anyway, um, the, the, um, 
the short version here is that um, That's right. And green is the dead road. That's right. Actually, repeat that because it's closing the door. Uh, yeah, just to repeat, the um, magenta is the number of uh, messages pulled out per second, decued per second. The green is the number of dead tuples. And the sort of bluish color is the number of live tuples. The number of live tuples is going up because in this test, I was inserting a megaton, like way more than it could, could uh, pull out, and that's because I had more, more clients doing that concurrently. Um, so obviously that's completely unacceptable, and the, the, you know, w without too much analysis, the, 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 the basic problem is that vacuum isn't keeping up, and it's interfering with the performance. So I tweaked, um, and that's just using the default settings, which, um, which are obviously in, in insufficient. Um, in the bottom left chart here, it's the same, the same setup, but um, Tweaks so that it vacuums more often, and that's just got a lower. It's got a lower nap time, and we see that the um, performance becomes very zigzaggy. But at least it doesn't have all those different modes and go completely crazy like that. Um, and then in the in this final chart here, I, I, I pulled the nap time right down so that it would um, ten second to uh, uh, eight seconds, I think it was, um, and, and and performance becomes hopefully slightly more acceptable here. But still, we, we you know we we see the effects of vacuum interfering with the workload at the back there. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Okay. So just for the for the um, recording, I'll just say um, so the the Sloney guys um, who have a kind of a queue for the change log, change set log, whatever it's called, they um, just completely escaped this by having multiple tables and switching between them and truncating so that vacuum wouldn't get involved, or, which is. Right. Okay, and I'll just try and summarize that if I can um, for the microphone. Um, the, the, um, um, that when you get a, a huge backlog, so the queue becomes very large, and then you catch up processing that, you can sometimes finish up with um, used pages um, sparsely spread around um, the heap, and so it doesn't ever manage to truncate the, the thing. Um, I suppose that's the basic summary, right? Um, so then you get this kind of ongoing effect caused by an earlier moment when you had a very large um, backlog.
but is is it the case that that isn't it the case that if if you eventually manage to have an empty queue, you'll still eventually have an opportunity to truncate, right? Well, it's a bit of luck, right? bit of luck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't have too much more, but uh, we can talk about that again in a moment. So get to the question time. Okay, um, so what things could we do better in Postgres that would help with this kind of workload? Well, one thing I've noticed is that um, if you have many consumers and you're using the uh, listen notify approach to signaling, um, you can get a kind of stampede like a thundering herd problem type thing where um, you just put one thing in the queue and you notify and everybody that's listening on the queue, which might be, let's say you have 64 of these workers or whatever, they're all gonna wake up and then go and look in the queue and that's kind of a waste of CPU. So if we had a kind of signaling mechanism which um, were more like a function that you call and you just block waiting for it to, to give, and, and then you had a way to notify one um, and it would just, you know, something like that could be a good addition, I think, to Postgres and could be done as, a, as, a, as an extension to support this kind of workload. Um, this is kind of a, almost a silly thing to put on a slide because it's obviously a gigantic engineering task and not, not, coming, not coming to a database near you soon. But um, the, the whole, um, and, and it isn't really specific to queuing, uh, but just looking at the, the behavior of, of vacuum and trying to get smooth performance from a system like this is just a, a good reminder that, um, that you know, other databases don't face this kind of problem because they use the, the um, undo log approach to managing um, multiple version concurrency control. Um, and, and no doubt such approaches bring other problems into your life, um, but perhaps at some point Postgres will address that and then you just won't have to worry about that kind of vacuuming problem. Um, uh, another thing which I thought about a bit in the process of working with queues and in the process of working on skip locked is that um, queue-like workloads are the worst case for serializable or one of the worst cases for serializable transaction isolation. And yet, serializable transaction, transaction isolation is a really good thing that you might want to be using. Um, so it, it occurred to me that the, there could be something that if you sort of tilt your head sideways and squint, it might sort of be a bit like skip locked, which kicks in when you're using serializable. If you have two sessions that both um, tell the database that they want some rows and they don't care what order they come in, um, and, you only want, and they've got a, a limit clause saying you, you only want one row, then maybe there's some way you could teach the executor to show, to, to show different rows to the different sessions because some other session has an, S, an SI read lock. Um, it would just be reordering the rows, um, but it, it would mean that two, two sessions that are running at the same time that both say, hey, give me one row out of whatever there is. Um, I, I don't care which one it is. If two sessions say that and they're both serializable, maybe one would see one row and another would see another row to, as a strategy to avoid a, a strictly unnecessary um, conflict. Um, that's maybe a bit weird, I don't know. Um, but in some way it's sort of conceptually linked to skip locked, but it doesn't have to be so brutal because skip, skip locked is a kind of primitive mechanism. It sort of shows you an inconsistent view of the database, right? It shows you, it's hiding a row from you because someone else happens to have it locked. But maybe there's a more gentle way to do that that could be somehow worked into, into the SSI mechanism. 
or rather the executor when it's running in that mode. That's just an idea. And that's it. Um, any more questions or comments? Yeah, so um, Postgres has had advisory locking for a long time, and it's a thing where um, you can, uh, using a number, you can say, please um, please lock number 42. And if anyone else tries to use advisory lock number 42, they'll have to wait. Or you can try lock 42, and it'll succeed or fail. So if you can somehow, if there's something in your queue-like table, which is some kind of ID that you can munge into an integer, or is an integer, for example, then you can use that as a way to, you'd put that in the where clause. So whereas skip locked goes in the, um, in the um, for update clause, um, you say select blah from blah, you know, for update, um, skip locked, limit one. Um, in this case, you would put it into the where clause. You'd say where, what is it, pg underscore try underscore advisory lock, whatever, however, you, however you spell it, um, 42, or, or id rather, if id is an integer, or hash of the id or whatever, some way to convert it into a, into a number, and that's a way to, to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, skip lock is one of the reasons why I'm saying it's an easy way to get the right thing. Okay. Uh, uh, so, the, I guess the next time I look at the list, the word that I've been seeing is the word type. So, um, can you just use that? Okay. So, the question is is there a canned sort of thing we can use? Um, so, I'm aware of. Um, uh, Q Classic for Ruby people. That's a, a library that I haven't used. I, I don't do Ruby myself, but it, I, I gather it's quite popular. Um, and it does all of these tricks and uh, um, provides a, a simple interface to that. Oh. So is, is the problem that um, the Ruby no, uh, it's Python it's client? It's it's yeah, but but does the Ruby driver for libpq not not expose the socket, so you can't use select to wait for? Um, Or did, did, did whoever implement that not use that trick so that you would essentially so be? Looking for someone who, who knows just the notifying is going to fail in most cases. Hmm. Uh, why do we know that this is so common? Pretty much the whole thing. So maybe we can get some memory back in some you know, target problem. I, I have to look that up now. Where, where was the memory leaked or waste, wasted? Well, I, I think um, notify and listen are, are, are good and very useful, and it's good that, that, that the semantics with sending on commit and so on, that's all great. But I do think that we could probably, as I said in, in my slide, do something a little bit better, um, particularly something that can deliver to one of the listeners. And that means changing 
so that you can know how many listeners there are, that means changing to a model where someone's actually blocking while they wait with a function call or something like that. I think we could probably do something a little bit better. At the back there. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so I, I think we could definitely do better than listen and notify. Um, yep. I, I think probably a B tree is the right thing for this. And I think if you have an ordering which is basically going up, like, for example, the time, um, then and, and you're consuming things in that order, then a B tree will, will behave very, very well, I think. Um, B tree bloat comes from, B tree bloat, bloat comes from filling up a B tree and then deleting everything out of it, but in, in a kind of decimating way, so that you leave bits scattered all over it, so that... <laughs> do, do, you have, do you have that problem? Uh. Uh, interesting. What and what's the um, what kind of thing are you using as the index as the key in the index? Like, I mean, how do you get to that that pattern where where you've filled up a range of values and then deleted bits from that range? Okay, so you've got an, you're indexing it by insertion time, and uh, they specify when it would be. Yeah. But PG repack would reorganize tuples in the heap. The, the right, I see. Okay, I see. I see. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. It's been, um, it's, I think it's come up on at least one of the mailing lists a couple of times. Um, no, I don't have a plan to do that at, at, at the moment. It does sound interesting though. If you, if you want to, the thing with limit, the first thing is, do you want to have limit on updates? That seems kind of weird, right? Because it, 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 it's like putting a limit on a select is kind of filtering the results from, from a query, which seems okay. But doing an update where you have a limit on it, what does that actually mean in terms of relational algebra or something? It kind of seems a bit weird. Does it? Oh, I, then we should add that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean. So, so, I think we're out of time, and we need to wrap up. Thank you.